Matthew 15. I want you to find the 21st verse. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. So our Lord's, uh, he's headed in a uh, strange direction. He's going into the lands of uh, Phoenicia. So uh, he's crossed over the borders. So there's a lot to learn from this, but uh, immediately gets to this place for well, Tyre and Sidon. It's a place of infamy, a place of uh, great apostasy and idolatry. And um, no sooner comes into this, the coasts of Tyre and Sidon that he's confronted with a woman. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out from the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. O Lord, thou son of David. You know, it's very significant that she already understands who he is, uh, that he is, uh, announces him as Lord. Now, she's a Gentile. What does she know about any of this? That the Lord would come and stem from the uh, lineage of David. So she's already speaking words of faith, isn't she? And, uh, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So this woman, uh, described in the Gospel of Mark as a Syrophoenician, Syrophoenician, so the combination of Syria and Phoenicia that's involved here, Syrophoenician woman. So uh, we want to know something about this. You know, I always think it's important for us to know the uh, topography and the uh, uh, the graphic relationship that's involved here. So let's take a look here real quickly to a map. And so we're going to go here to the northern section of Israel. There's the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, remember, uh, hailed from Nazareth, which is kind of an outpost from that, and did most of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this territory that had been divided out when the children of Israel came in to conquer in the book of Joshua, the land is divided out, inheritance is given. And uh, the tribes of Asher and Naphtali and Manasseh, the northern tribes up here, and they come right up to the very coasts of Phoenicia. There's Syrophoenicia right there, the Syrophoenician border, and Tyre and Sidon would be two major seaports along uh, uh, this uh, Phoenician territory. Now, in uh, Isaiah chapter 9, you have this notion of, nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. So, uh, Galilee of the nations. So, here we have this territory, uh, the Galilean territory and so on. And it's all described here as having some, uh, a light coming and a glory coming to them. The, the light of the Lord. And so, uh, this all has to do with, uh, well, maybe this map shows it a little better here. So, you understand some of the territory and what we're talking about. There's that Syrophoenician uh, border and Tyre and Sidon being the main seaports and you can see how it abuts this territory of the Galilean territory and uh, the Naphtalene um, inheritance and Zebulun all of this being prophesied that uh, the light would come and shine suddenly uh, the dimness uh, would be uh, ultimately vanquished by the light the people that walked in darkness They've seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So that's, of course, in Isaiah, 700 years before this is going to happen. But here is the light of the world, Jesus. Here he is crossing the borders, going and reaching out into the Gentile nations and uh, about to shine light to a very darkened world. And uh, a citizen of this, uh, a denizen of this darkness is the Syrophoenician woman. She comes to Jesus. She owns him as Lord. And she brings her requests and makes her request known unto God. So uh, it's really a rather glorious thing. Now Jesus was to come as a light to the Gentiles. That's part of this prophecy right here. And of course there's much more to it. And then um, we find 
That when Zacharias, you know, remember he was given the, uh, the promise of John the Baptist, the harbinger would come and he would light the light before Jesus, you know, and he would bring in uh, people to repentance, prepare their hearts, you know, baptize them. And uh, so John is finally born. Uh, Zacharias, for nine months now, has not been able to say a word. His tongue has been silenced because Gabriel said, you're not going to believe what I said? You don't believe that your wife, who's been barren all these years, is suddenly going to bear a child? Well, if you don't believe me, you're going to not be able to tell anybody for nine months. And nine months of silence, and he could not speak a word. I'm telling you, women would die, but uh, Zacharias, he was able to abide, right? And then suddenly his tongue is loosed. And he says, this child is born to give knowledge of salvation unto his people and the remission of sins through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring, that's Christ, from on high hath visited us. The light is shining to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And thus we have kind of a vague reference to Isaiah 9 too, right? And the veil and the shadow of death the light does shine to guide our feet into the way of peace. Uh, so that's uh, the beginning, of course. And Christ uh, then was taken after his birth for his circumcision and his dedication. And uh, immediately Mary and Joseph are confronted by a prophet, Simeon. And uh, he sees the child he has been waiting for. And he says, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So we understand that Jesus' mission was not exclusive. He would come first to his own people. Paul would later use that as an example for what he did when he went ministering on his missionary journeys. He would go first to the Jew, to the Jew first, then to the Greek. And that's what we find here in Jesus' ministry. He's crossing over the borderline now, and he's reaching out to the Gentiles. And thus, and immediately, there's one that comes begging a boon from him. So, and behold, this woman came and said, O oh Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. You've got to come to help me. I need your help, Lord. I hope your daughters aren't vexed with devils. Are they? Your sons? Your children? I tell you, beware. The devil is a crafty enemy. And he has many designs. And he, he does things subtly like a serpent. But he brings a venom for certain. You've got to protect your daughters and your sons from the influence of the devil. Our children today are grievously vexed with the devil. What do you mean? Well, there's all this that's around them. They're surrounded by it. It's the information age, don't you know? And our kids are being influenced by it, drawn away by these evil uh, websites. And they're, they're brought into uh, TikTok. The Chinese are infiltrating us. They're communists. And they're doing all that they can to influence our young people away from God. So TikTok wouldn't permit it if I were you. If I was raising children in this generation, would not permit it. No TikTok. Uh, and Facebook and all these other places where these kids get on and they get into trouble. And they get learning things that I think are evil things. Well, of course, the entertainment. What do I need to say? You already all know this, don't you? You can see it. It's so blatant. You know, it used to be the devil would kind of hide himself. Not anymore. He's on Main Street and, sh and he is strutting up and down, I'm telling you right now. Uh, of course, now they, they're brainwashed in the, in the school system, aren't they? The public school system is rife with evil and teaching evil doctrines and anti-Christ positions. Uh, the politics is all messed up today, that's for sure. And, uh, the, well, we've got all this advertising, trying to draw people in. They've got to have this, got to have that, got to have the latest, and so on. All of that has to do with lust, 
We have a lot to say about it on Wednesday nights. The love of money is really more than just love of money. It's the love of things. It's the love of, an, of ambition and desire. It lust in all of its various forms. Which is, I'm not satisfied with what I have. I'm not contented. I want more. And that's what advertising is all about. Getting more and get, putting desires in your heart. You're not satisfied with what you have. And isn't that the original sin? The love of money is the root of all evil. And the love of, of having, the love of, of desire, covetousness, it's the root of all evil. But then that's Wednesday night's message. But it's the advertisers. And now we've got kids, of course, that are deciding that they want to be just like the world. They want ink on their uh, bodies everywhere. The Bible forbids it. Uh, it's a moral problem. The Bible permits, the, forbids tattooing, inking, pay, making marks in your body and cuttings in your flesh. This is of the devil. It's honoring the devil and honoring hell and honoring all the people that are in hell. It's demonic. Uh, so I hope I'm being clear about it. Amen. News media, of course, these people, I tell you, they get everybody worked up. Got everybody worked up to a frenzy. Got people worried and nervous about everything, including the weather. I mean, people so, uh, now today we shut everything down and so forth. Uh, it's minus 21 degrees, a uh, wind chill if you're standing somewhere in a freezer. But, you know, it's craziness what's going on. Shut everything down. An inch of snow, two inches of snow and so forth. Now, I don't want to be one of these old timers, you know, just, uh, I don't want to be a splenetic curmudgeon. He said, go look it up. But okay, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. Nonetheless, when I was young, we walked to school. Anybody else walk to school? I walked to school. I don't remember there was ever a time where they canceled school. Nope. And we had snow like you've never seen it. Snowmageddon. We had foot, two feet of snow was common in the 50s. Anybody... Am I saying the truth? Amen. How many of you not remember this? How many of you remember? Okay, well, some of you don't want to admit you're that old. But I mean, you are that old. But I don't remember anything being canceled and so forth. But you see, we're, we've got a very weak age at this point. Weak. The devil gets people all worked up about nothing. God's people should have peace. Amen. And the devil's disturbing our peace all the time. You know, it gets all worked up about this thing and that and so forth. And there's one story after the other after the other. There's no end to this. And so we say, Lord, uh, you're in charge of everything. I have perfect peace, Lord. Everything's going to work out together for good. The kingdom is coming with the king. That settles it. And then we've got kids, of course, that are addicted to video games and there's so much violence in these video games and so many ugly thoughts that uh, they end up uh, addicted to it and chained to it. And they spend hours uh, playing video games when they should be spending hours uh, doing work, physical work. Uh, they should uh, be reading their Bibles. Uh, this is what's important. This is nonsense and this will lead to no good thing. The wrath of God, of course, comes upon the children of disobedience, the Bible says. Um, yeah, that encourages violent behavior. Studies show that those who watch uh, simulated violence like that in video games can become immune to the violence and more inclined to act violently themselves. We're wondering, you know, all these mass shootings, all these kids that are getting guns and shooting up in schools, and it, that didn't happen when I was in. We had some serious problems when I was in school. Some, some kids actually came to school and chewed gum in class. We didn't have anybody shooting. We didn't have, have to go through a metal detector. What's happened? Well, the devil. I said before, you know, he was subtle before. Now he's on Main Street. He's strutting. And he's got these young kids all worked up through violent video games and Promotes antisocial behavior, spending too much time playing video games can isolate children. They may spend less time doing other activities such as reading, sports, homework, interaction with family and friends. Not good. Discourage children to do well in school even. There are studies that show that the more time children spend playing video games, the lower their performance is in school. A study found that video game addicts have lower grades and have more uh, destructive behaviors such as arguing and fighting with parents and teachers. So uh, 
Uh, what good does it accomplish at the end? So put this thing away, start to understand we've got uh, more important issues. So our children are vexed with the devil, aren't they? Look at the occult influence in the media. Uh, this Harry Potter thing started, what, 30 years ago? When was it? 20 years ago? Whenever it started, I tell you what, uh, the school system said, oh, this is terrific. The kids are finally, they want to read. What are they reading? They're reading about witchcraft, uh, casting spells. They're talking uh, uh, sorcery. Uh, they, these things that the Bible forbids for believers. I tell you what, people have said to me, you know, they, we, we, we got a devil in the house, right? Poltergeist. And I've been invited to, to go to houses and uh, cast out the devil. Now they're hoping I'm going to come, you know, and anoint to the house with holy water. Now I come and do something practical. I say, you know, let's throw some things out here. Let me see what your video games are all about. Let me see what your television shows you're watching. Let me see what you're, what you're reading here. Let's throw these things out. Cast the devil out of here. Don't give him an open door to your house. Shut him out. We don't need him here. All right, so we have video games and... I mean, media, you name it, the cartoons, you've got all this demonic stuff happening and kids are being influenced by it. Teenagers are learning to disobey God early in their lives and learning about the occult and learning about uh, uh, various uh, occultic practices like the Star Wars where uh, the, they actually teach levitation. I think so does Harry Potter, you know, with his wand and so forth, has things levitating and, and kids say, that's power, that's something I can see. And all we're offering you is something that you cannot see. That's what faith is all about, trusting God. Oh, the devil uh, loves to bring drugs and addiction, right? Begins with cigarettes, but it doesn't end there. Most of them move on from the cigarettes and they start smoking dope. And we've got a senator in Pennsylvania that wants to legalize it, make it, bring it right here to our state and so forth, so that you can go right down the street and buy weed. And uh, he probably himself is addicted to it. So, uh, and it, it makes people stupid. You know, I'm dumb enough. I don't need to be high on some drug. And now we've got fentanyl deaths. I mean, how many of these fentanyl funerals? I've done uh, several of them. And it's very heartbreaking stuff. Just uh, kids dying. 20-year-old uh, girl, 23 or so. Uh, uh, I guess she wanted a high. And she heard from her friends that this, you'll really get a high with this one. And maybe even just taking it, uh, not knowing there was fentanyl interlaced in whatever she was taking, and boom, she's dead. Imagine, you walk up in the bedroom, and you, you don't know what's going on in the bedroom, and there you find her, she's dead. Uh, just the devil. <laughs> hate the devil. Don't you hate the devil? Amen. But the devil says, well, look, look at him, right? He's looking at you. My people, it's foolish, God said. They've not known me. They're sottish children. And they have not any understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Oh yeah, our children are vexed with the devil. And these uh, rock and rollers and these evil demons that teach them uh, their rap music and their hip hop and all the rest and what kind of idols they are to our children. And every one of them uh, advocate fornication. That's what their music is all about, fornication. Having sex before you're married, this is unlawful in the sight of God. And your life will be cursed if you move in these directions. Alcohol is unlawful. If you touch this poison, there'll be a curse that accompanies it. Don't go anywhere near it. A child is vexed with the devil. That's what it has to do with it. Amen. And you might say, how'd that happen? Well, she's living in the midst of idolatry. She's living in the midst of paganism. She's living in the midst of devil worship. And so the children are influenced. And from a child, they should know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make them wise unto salvation. But he answered her not a word. So she came and said, Lord, my daughter is vexed with the devil. And he answered not a word. You know, there's times when we think God isn't hearing. Don't believe that for a minute. He heard every word, but he did not answer her. Now, there's, there's a reason behind this, and I want to tell you, if you're going to find God, you have to seek him with all of your heart. Amen. There are too many people that are just half-heartedly, you know, maybe they'll believe, maybe, you know, it's like they'll give God a chance, and that won't work. Jeremiah said, you shall seek for me, and you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Amen. And so, you see, 
You can't just come to Jesus and say, Lord, I want this, that, and the other, and so forth. He doesn't answer. He's waiting. Waiting to see if you really mean this or not. Answer or not a word. And his disciples came and they besought him saying, Lord, send her away. She crieth after us. She crieth that? What do you mean? Well, you see, they're the bodyguards. Jesus is at rest. And they're saying, now, he's, not seeing, he's not seeing people today, right? And here comes this Gentile, and they're all Jewish. And there's already an animosity between them. And a certain xenophobia they'll have nothing to do with. And here's a Gentile coming. They don't even want to be here in Syrophoenicia. Perhaps they've already queried Jesus on the matter. What are we doing crossing a border into Gentile land? We're not, we'll be unclean by being here amongst these people. They didn't understand his mission, did they? And so here's a Gentile woman coming. They said, no, no, he's not, he's not entertaining requests today. And she crieth after us, which means she did not take no for an answer. Amen. Now that's a wonderful attribute that most women have, right? Amen. They don't take no for an answer. Amen. And they say to their, well, their husband has to, <laughs> they'll nag and pick. And so finally the husband said, all right, <laughs> can't take any more, right? <laughs> That's a good thing. Amen. If it's a right issue, it's a good thing. Amen. So they said, hey, stop her. Lord, she's bothering us. She won't say, take no for an answer. And uh, <laughs> I think it's a glorious picture here, right? And, uh, but he answered finally. He said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's, that means no, doesn't it? That means I can't do this. I have to feed my own children first. I, I can't, there's nothing I can do for you. And uh, so that means she goes away, right? No, no. She said, uh, then came she and worshipped him. She broke through the apostles somehow. And she got there down at her, on her face before God and worshipped him. Lord, help me. Now, what a pathetic cry. Lord, help me. She heard what he said, but this case was too important to her. She was not going to let her daughter go to hell. Vexed with the devil. Help me, Lord. I hope you spend a lot of time, if you have children. I hope you spend a lot of time with them. I hope you pray for them. I hope you kneel by their bedside and at night beg God for their salvation while they're sleeping. Because that's your duty as a father, as a mother. Help me, Lord. Haven't you ever asked him for help? Amen. Why, the Lord is my helper. Right, Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Yes, he's our helper. That's one of his many titles, the Lord, my helper, my parakletos, my comforter, my helper. And, and he's here to help us. Now, I almost, you're probably tired of hearing my same illustrations, but, you know, I stroked 10 years ago and I needed help. I was in a helpless condition. I could not speak. I could not move my left hand or my left foot. Uh, I could not obey commands. When I spoke, of my mouth was like that. So I was in trouble. I was in trouble, and I needed help. And they rushed me down to Shadyside Hospital, and down there they uh, strapped me and said, "You're going to. We're going to have to give you this TPA shot, and we're going to." Uh, you have to sign for this because, you, you know, it's a dangerous drug. It's a blood thinner, super blood thinner. You could, you could uh, hemorrhage. You could die from it. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the, I'm signing my life away, maybe. I don't know. And they said before, we've got to take you in for the MRI. And they strapped me into the MRI and took me in, you know. And they wheeled me in there. And they got my head, you know, in a way so it can't shake and so forth. And um, the MRI. And they said, no. We're going to find out whether you had a stroke or not. And sure enough, I came out and they said, you've had a major stroke and it's on the right side and we can see it. And you, know, you had a blood clot up there and we're going to give you the shot. And before they gave me the shot, 
I was in that MRI and I was reciting this verse right here, Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Well, I needed help. I needed strength. I needed him to uphold me. And he promised to do just that. And so I came out, as you, I think you all realize, I came out without any residual effects from the stroke. And I see people almost every week when I'm ministering in these various places and I see them with strokes and I think that could be me. But the Lord was very merciful and he was my helper. For the Lord thy God will hold, hold thee by your right hand, right? Amen. Saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Fear thou not, thou worm Jacob and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel. The Lord is your helper. And here's this Gentile has foreigner to the promises of God and the commonwealth of Israel falling on her face and worshiping knowing all her false gods couldn't save or help her but the son of God could help me Lord what a pathetic but beautifully um, productive cry the Lord is my helper so we have this word parakletos in the Greek and it has a number of meanings but one is the comforter, that's a good one. An intercessor, wonderful, helper, counselor and even an advocate and a defender at the court of law. Uh, so let's take all of that word in and it's a powerful one at that and Jesus is all of that and more. The comforter, the helper, the counselor, the advocate and the defender Amen. at the great bar of judgment. I'll tell you what, you can't miss with that legal team when you stand before the Lord. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not if any man sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What a helper we have in Jesus. <laughs> All right. So, we might say, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob. After all, she said, son of David, right? Hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Let's not forget this woman is Syrophoenician. Where has her help and hope been for these many years? in a false god called Baal. That's who her worship was. And to the female goddess, the mother, the queen of heaven, she's called, <coughs> Ashtaroth. These Phoenician gods that have no power. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He's to be praised above all the gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. So... <laughs> False gods can't save you. They have, they're, they don't, they're called gods, but we'll put a little G on that. That's all. They're, they're gods the way the people look at them, the idols of the world, but they can't help you. Only the living God. And so she brought her petition before the living God. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread <laughs> and to cast it to dogs. Mm. Harsh words. Those are harsh words. But they're true words. Now commentators like to soften the blow a bit and say, well, wait, he meant really like a little puppy. He said, you're just a little puppy. No, 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 that's not what he meant. He meant to say a hard thing. It is a hard thing. Jesus says hard things. Wonders how you'll react, because I've seen it in 50 years of ministry. When you say a hard thing, people get offended. And that's it. She could have easily just said that. You call me a dog? I'm out of here. Or she could have said, Roof, roof, roof. Right? Amen. 
You can either decide to believe what God has said about you, or you can reject it. And you see, sometimes he says hard things intentionally to see how you'll react. And if I were you, I would believe whatever he said about me. Amen. Whatever he says is the truth. If he says your heart, now what do they say in the world? They say, trust your heart. I have a little video I put together, you know, a conglomeration of the various modern songs. I guess now it's so old, but I don't know what the latest ones are. But you hear it in so many songs. Trust your heart. Trust your heart. And they moan it and they groan it. Yeah, trust your heart. Just trust your heart. And it goes on and on. I mean, I have like 50 of these videos put one after the other. They're all saying the same thing. Because that's what the devil says. Trust your heart. But Jeremiah, God says, the heart is deceitful. Amen. Above all things and desperately wicked. That's a hard thing. It's hard to hear that, but it's the truth, isn't it? They are hard, but true words. She was a Gentile. She was not of the nation of Israel. The Gentiles were considered unclean because of their paganism because of their demonism, because of their, the way they conducted themselves in the world. <coughs> and so they were rightly called dogs, pariah. And um, it was authorized. It was a pejorative term. So, no, I know modern commentators want to say, no, nah, Jesus would never say something like that. Oh, yes, he says hard things. If he can bring you to Christ, it's worth it. If you can accept the insult that you are a sinner, if you can accept that, then good things are coming your way. I can tell you that right now. Jesus had just said here in Matthew 15, last week I preached on it, there in the verses just right above this, he said some hard things, didn't he? Very hard things. He said, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, right? Out of the heart. Um, murders. Uh, theft or adultery uh, what's next here fornications I think thefts are coming up here thefts right so he said false witnesses liars and blasphemies he said all these things come out of your heart it's out of your heart beloved that's why we need a new heart this heart is corrupt it's a hard thing that Jesus is saying, but it's true. It's the truth. He said, all this comes out of your heart. That's how corrupt you are. You're a sinner before God. A dog. What will we do? Well, we ask for mercy, don't we? We hope for mercy. Jesus says hard things. In Matthew uh, 23, well, the whole chapter, well, we're in chapter 15, let's see. You want to predict when we'll get to 23? But we'll get there. And it is an excoriation of hypocrisy. Religious hypocrites. He called them serpents. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. He said, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's harsh. But true. But true. It should have provoked them to repentance. It could have. But instead they decided to be insulted by it. They decided who are you to tell us who are righteous that we're going to go to hell. How can you dare call us a generation of vipers when everyone knows we're the custodians of truth? We run the temple here. Jesus says hard things. Accept what he says and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That's true. Hard things. In John 8, he said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do because ye are not of God. Hard. He said, you're not, you're not believers. That's a hard thing. But it's the truth. And it would have led them to eternal life. So he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. But she said, Truth, Lord. 
true. What you say is the truth, Lord. If you called me a dog, it must be true. You're my creator. It must be true. I stopped doubting the Bible a long time ago. Skeptics have their problems with the Bible. Discrepancies, they call it. I have several books. One's called The Discrepancies Answered. And, uh, you know, it's just a book of answering all what the people say. There's inconsistencies and hypocrisy in the Bible and so forth. So they point all these things out. And uh, that book is a helpful book. It's called Apologetics, essentially, where you're defending God. He needs no defense. Doesn't need mine and so <laughs> forth. A long time ago, I decided if I don't understand something, it's not God's fault. It's mine. If I'm looking at something and saying, oh, God doesn't sound right. You know, in my daily reading here, I just, I'm in uh, Joshua. And God is giving all those orders out to you. God, take the Canaanites and you're going to destroy all the men, women, and children. And the skeptics love to point that and say, what do you have here? This, this is a brutal God. No mercies. But the Bible says everywhere that God is merciful. Old and New Testament. The Gnostics invented a separate God of the Old Testament. They call him the Demiurge. He's evil and so forth. The God of Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus and so forth. And the good God is Jesus in the New Testament. So they have two gods. It's a two-god system. Dualism. Ridiculous. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. Amen. If he's merciful and forgiving today, he was in the days of Joshua too. But I also know, as I know today, that his mercy comes to an end. There's a certain point where people say, I'm not following God. I'm going to do what I want to do. And God says, all right, you will pay a judgment for that. So if God says something that you don't understand, just say, I don't understand this. But one day I may. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, Isaiah 55 says. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so high are his thoughts than my thoughts, and his ways than our ways. Amen. So uh, I know that he does all things well. Amen. And that if God does something like destroys the earth with how many billions of people may have been on it before the flood, it seems to me that he is right in what he does. Amen. And if I don't understand it, one day he'll explain it to us. Amen. This woman figured it out. She said, truth, Lord. Did you call me a dog? Truth, Lord. You're right. I am a dog. In other words, she said, bow wow. Right? I, I'm a dog. Truth, Lord. But, she said, if I recall the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Well played. She knew if she kept asking, she would find a way to the heart of the Lord. And so she never gave up. She didn't go away. She kept praying. If we're going to pray, we better learn how to pray without ceasing. It says that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, there it is. Pray without ceasing. It's only three words. It's an imperative. We have those bite-sized imperatives there at the end of First Thessalonians. <laughs> Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. You know, they're just bite-sized commandments. Believers ought to live by them. Amen. Pray without ceasing. What's he mean? Never give up. Never give up. I know there are times that you say, well, I, it just seems like it's getting worse. I'm praying for my father. I'm praying for my daughter I'm praying for my grandson or I pray this that seems like it's getting worse Lord pray without ceasing Amen. that woman came and the Lord said I can't answer you and she said well uh, I'm going to keep asking you got to help me I, I have nowhere else to go to you have to help me you will help me I'll find a way to your heart Amen. well no she I can't I've got to feed the children first well, I'm a dog, but feed me the crumbs. That's all I need. You're that powerful. You're omnipotent. I don't need much from you, Lord. Just a few crumbs. That'll be enough. Amen. And I don't know. If, the Bible doesn't say, but did a smile cross the face of Jesus at that point? Amen. Did he say, you passed the test. You passed the test. I think that's what happened here. 
she had to pass the test. Amen. And she said, Lord, whatever you say about me is the truth. Amen. And all I need is a few crumbs. Will you help me now? You'll have your request. If you pray without ceasing, if you continue instant in prayer, if you like Job, who sent and sanctified his children every day, rose up early in the morning and offered, made offerings according to uh, the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this did Job continually. Oh yeah. And Abraham, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak yet, but once more, right? Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. He had gone from 50 all the way down to 10. And God said, for, I'll, I'll do it for 10. I'll save the whole city for 10. I don't think Abraham realized. He said, that should be it. Let's see, there's my two daughters. They're sons-in-law, right? This, and then they have children. He counted up. He said, 10, that should do it right there. I guess he figured they were all saved. And he wasn't counting on the fact that they weren't saved. Else he could have kept praying. Never stop. Jacob learned, wrestling with the angel till the breaking of day. And he said, uh, the angel said, let me go. The day's breaking. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Daniel, well, he continued, even though it was against the law to pray. Against the law. What kind of laws did the Medes and Persians have? They're trying to institute them right here in free America. They're trying to silence speech. I read an article about this uh, quarterback who is an outspoken Christian, apparently. Now, I'm not vouching for any of this because we've seen too many of this go the wrong way. But uh, he's just a rookie, C.J. Uh, Stroud. And when they interview him, he, ta he says, All glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not just, you know, thank God, but Jesus. And that name, you know, that's anathema. NBC doesn't want this. Uh, but he's going to give glory to Jesus Christ Amen. for anything that happens. Now, I, I don't think he believes, and no, no true Christian thinks that God is favoring one team over the other, and that's, that sort of thing. Uh, but he gives all glory to Jesus Christ, his Savior. And he had a rough life growing up in, in poverty. Dad was in jail. Uh, I mean, everything was wrong for his life. And he found Jesus. And when you find Jesus, you hold on to him no matter what. Amen. And what did the NBC do? They cut out his uh, glorifying Jesus Christ. They cut it out. They don't want that. They don't want that on the national television. They don't want people glorifying Jesus. Against the law. You know, we have a right to speak. We have a right as Christians. We have freedom of speech. But no, you know, the censors are saying, that's no, too offensive. We don't want that here. And so on. Hmm. Anna, she was a widow of four score and four years. But she departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers. Night and day. Never gave up. Of course, this Syrophoenician woman, she crieth after us. The widow in Luke 18 that comes to the unjust judge. She said, yet because this widow troubleth me. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the midnight friend in the parable in Luke 11 that comes and begs for bread for his neighbor is really, uh, it's really me, it's really you, knocking on the door of heaven, hoping that you have enough bread to spare for lost sinners. And we do intercessory prayers. And God says, keep knocking, and I'll give you the bread from heaven. And Jesus, of course, continued all night, many times, on mountains in prayer. Uh, we think of Rhoda, you know, they had a prayer meeting. Peter was thrown in jail, execution day tomorrow. And uh, I don't know, he slept. He was asleep. How do you sleep the night before they're going to execute you? But he was asleep. And uh, the angel came and woke him up and said, wake up here. And he thought it was a dream. And the angel said, no, no, you're free. Opened all the doors of the prison and got there. In fact, he said, uh, angel said, they got a prayer meeting going on for you. And, you, and they've been answered. Go see them. And so he goes to the door and he's knocking at the door and Rhoda comes to the door and they're inside. They're praying, Lord, deliver Peter from prison. Deliver him from prison. We pray. We've got to have him. We need him. He's the voice of the Lord for us. And, and they're praying and the door knocks and Rhoda goes to the door and it's Peter. 
Peter's at the door, knocking at the door, and Rhoda doesn't answer the door, but runs back into the prayer meeting and says, hey, it's Peter, he's at the door. And they said, no, he's not, he's in prison, we're praying for him, and you know. I think God has a sense of humor, don't you? He has to. He created me, he created you, he's got a sense of humor. <laughs> and so, well, Paul says, uh, I thank God whom I serve with my forefathers from, with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembered thee in prayers night and day. So um, Jesus says to her, O woman, great is thy faith. Now we see the compassion in the heart of the Lord, right? It was a hard test. It was harsh word. A harsh word. You're a dog. Can you accept that? I can't feed you before I feed the children of Israel. And she said, truth, Lord. Yes, that's all that I am. But surely you have a crumb. And he marvels. He says, oh, woman, this is great faith. You've shown great faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Let's pray. Well, there's more to the story, so we'll continue tonight. But I'm wondering today, here we are in this uh, cold Sunday morning, and we're here gathered together. I'm wondering if there's somebody in the room that's not saved. I don't know your heart. You could fool me for sure. I'm not omniscient, but you need to search your own heart. Have you accepted what the Bible says about us and who we are as sinful people? And have you accepted that there is mercy for dogs, crumbs from the cross, if we'll just take them and receive them? The Lord was able to save that, that poor child vexed with the devil she was at a distance, but he sent out his word, and his word healed. And he sent out his word today, and it heals us too. So let's stand together, Lord. Remember all of us here, whatever our needs are. We're here, Lord, because we love you. We want to learn from your word. We've assembled as you've instructed us to do, and we've been obedient to that command. Uh, We've come through hardships and difficulties, and yet we're here to hear, and our, our hearts are open. We pray, Lord, come into our heart and forgive our sin. Wash us, cleanse us, and make us whole. And then, Lord, we pray that you'll strengthen all of us here. All of us need some help in some way and strength in some way. So do remember us here, Lord. Be kind to us and show us your great mercies, Lord. Now teach us to pray as we ought to and to continue in prayer. Let nothing get in the way to hinder this so very important a matter. If the Lord's speaking, you're certainly invited to the altar this morning. You can kneel down and speak whatever's on your heart to the Lord. Bring your requests and make them known unto God and the peace of God passeth all understanding should keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Dedicate yourself this year to the service of the Lord. Your great helper will give you power to speak and to say that which needs to be said. Your helper will be there through all of the contests with the devil to defeat him in your life and to get victory over your habit and sin. The helper will be there when we go through physical disability. And we wonder if we can take even one more day. And he'll give us grace for the moment. He that suffered is able to succor us in our moments of great need. So Lord, be our helper. As we leave this place, Lord, protect us from all harm and from the evil of the devil. Help us to put our guard up. To realize, Lord, that his mission, malicious mission, is to vex us and our children. So help us to be free. Liberate us this morning. Let us not be fools, but wise to his craft. We pray, Lord, that we'd understand his subtleties. The more we hear from your word, the 
the wiser we will become. Give us understanding, Lord, we pray. Then, Lord, give us uh, the joy of Jesus. Help us to be glad that we're saved and citizens of another world. And we pray that we begin living like that. Cleanse our heart, cleanse our mind, cleanse our thoughts, cleanse our words. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.